Don't Starve. In my opinion, the best survival crafting game to come out of that genre's 2013 Zara Gold Rush. This game just turned 10 years old and is my all-time most played game on pretty much every platform I own it on. And when you factor in the multiplayer pseudo-sequel Don't Starve Together, it's likely only second to Pokemon in terms of franchise playtime for me. A few weeks ago I saw a video by Bidobams where he and a friend tried to survive on Don't Starve Together's Lunar Island for as long as they could from the moment they spawned in, and I thought, hey, I'm a good Don't Starver, why don't I give that a try? And off I went to see if I could survive a hundred days on the Lunar Island. Let's begin. For those unfamiliar, Don't Starve is a game where you are a meek little squishy character thrown into an uncaring world where even the darkness itself wants you dead. The gameplay loop mainly consists of gathering food and materials, and then using them to prolong your existence and build new items at research stations that let you explore more of the world and defeat greater foes. The Lunar Island is a chunk of the... moon... don't worry about it, it's complicated... that fell off a while back and is completely cut off from the mainland, requiring a boat or other means of traversing the briny blue. None of that for us, though. As soon as I spawn in, I'll run a command that will instantly warp me to the largest of the lunar islands, and from there, I'm not allowed to make a boat or anything else that takes me off of this beautiful glassy plain. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we even spawn into our lovely lunar landscape, we need to figure out which of the 18 playable characters we'll be working with. To make this brief, I'll show you my top three. In third place, I have Wartox. Wartox is an imp from beyond this world and can harvest the souls of creatures that die near him. In addition to granting him instant teleportation, souls are also his main form of sustenance, as mortal food doesn't nourish him quite as much. The downside is that chugging that much soul juice definitely has a deleterious effect on his mental state, as he'll take a hit to his sanity stat for each one. This is actually a benefit for this challenge, as the topsy-turvy celestial magic that dominates the lunar island reverses our sanity into enlightenment, causing lunar monsters known as gestalts to hunt us down and tuck us into bed if we're too sane. Second up is Wilson, who for a long, long time was the blank canvas starting character with nothing but a beard and however much gumption he could fit into his stylish hair. Back in March he received a rework update that gave him much more to play around with, gaining a skill tree that he could fill out in torch, alchemy, and beard skills. The main draw for us is his alchemy powers, letting him turn rocks into flint and twigs into logs. The Lunar Island has limited resources, but rocks and twigs are some of the most abundant renewables on the island, and these skills will alleviate the need to ration limited supplies. Despite the benefits of these two, I think one character feels right at home on the Lunar Island, perhaps because they were born from it. Wormwood is a living mass of vines coiled around a shard that fell from the moon back in Don't Starve's Hamlet DLC. As a result, they gain and lose sanity for their treatment of plants. Wormwood is also one of the best farmers in Don't Starve Together, able to take seeds and plant them wherever there's arable soil, even without the use of a garden digmajig to till the earth. Finally, they also have a zero times health multiplier on the foods they eat, gaining none of the healing benefits, but suffering none of the detrimental effects of their food. The main sources of food on the Lunar Island are bull kelp fronds and monster meat, two foods that are great for lowering your sanity, but come with a health cost that Wormwood shrugs off entirely. With our character set, I don a suitably lunar salamander outfit, and we begin the dawn of day one. One of Don't Star's fundamental materials is cut grass. It makes torches and campfires, which are one of the most basic sources of light in this game. It can be refined at a science machine into rope, a staple of almost every armor and weapon crafting recipe, and it also can't be found anywhere on the Lunar Island. Without any grass from the outside world, we have very few options for making it to day two without taking a hundred damage from the resident girl boss night monster and queen of the world, Charlie. Luckily for us, the fire pit is a reusable version of the campfire and only costs rocks and logs, two things that we can get on day one. You may notice I'm wandering around this rocky biome rather than doing any gathering, and that's because this isn't my first time doing this challenge. On my first attempt, I made it to day 26 before realizing that because the island only spawned with about 10 gold nuggets, I would have to choose between a lightning rod to keep my base safe in the spring, or an endothermic fire pit, one of the only consistent sources of cold available for the summer. Not wanting to leave it to chance, I decided to start new save files and check how much gold their lunar island had before fully diving into that world. In total, we need 19 gold nuggets, one for a science machine, eight for four electrical doodads split two and two between the alchemy engine and endothermic fire pit, 
four to make a lightning rod, and six to make a birdcage, which will provide a few opportunities later. Each of these gold-lined boulders will give us one gold nugget, with a 25% chance to yield a second. After a few islands with insufficient bling, I managed to find this island with exactly 19 boulders, enough to make everything I wanted and potentially have a little gold to spare at the end. With nighttime fast approaching, I collected the logs we needed by using a glass axe from a set piece that almost always spawns on the lunar island, which proved to be a good move as I barely scraped together the two flint for a pickaxe to gather the 12 rocks we needed, placing a fire pit just as the night closed in. If it came down to it, there were a few workarounds I had in mind, as there's a guaranteed set piece on every lunar island that contains a bath bomb and a hot spring that has already had one thrown in, which emits heat and light until the next full moon. I could also have used the Gestalts to put me to sleep, which would keep Charlie away perhaps long enough to reach the dawn unscathed. But with no need for such desperate strategies, I decided to stand in the shadowy edges of our firelight to lower our enlightenment going into day two. Day two isn't nearly as harrowing as day one because of these little pockmarks in the ground called celestial fissures. As the moon's phases move towards full, the fissures will emit more and more light and start gushing with sanity increasing auras that will make us see gestalts very quickly if we stray too long. Since most of the island is covered with them, we have no fear of Charlie for a long while. I spent most of day two collecting up all the gold suffused boulders I could and raked in 23 gold nuggets for us to work with going forward. I caught myself wondering if Wilson's ability to turn Niter into gold made him truly the strongest Lunar Island character, but with dusk approaching I couldn't stop to ponder long, as I got to work gathering more materials for our essentials and putting up an alchemy engine before settling in for the night. On day 3 I immediately set to work crafting, only slightly slowed by the constant harassment from the Gestalts. After putting up an endothermic fire pit and lightning rod to cover for the lighter seasons, I set to work planting the mystery seeds that crows had brought me. Since the Reap What You Sow update, crop plants have a list of things that make them happy, which will improve the amount of seeds you get when you harvest them. Without tilled soil there's no way for us to provide the right nutrients or any water besides the occasional rain, but we can get up to two seeds with just words of encouragement, staying on top of weeds, and planting at least four of the same crop nearby, with our crops growing, I wandered over to the Loon Tree Forest biome and found a nearby hot spring, tossing the bath bomb I picked up from the set piece into it. Because we have no grass, we can't craft any torches, meaning we have to get a little creative if we want to set anything on fire. Luckily for us, the salamanders here love to soak up all the heat they can get from these hot springs, and when the spring is boiling like this, they'll ripen, gaining a new attack where they shoot fire in a small radius. By carefully baiting out this attack, we can burn up a few groups of the forest and get an important resource, charcoal. After gathering some of the saplings here with a shovel so we can transplant them closer to our base, I head back as day four dawns. Starting off the day with some light gardening, I tend to the farm by removing the fire nettles and forget-me-lots that have sprouted up, and plant the saplings that I gathered last night. I then set out to the last lunar biome that we haven't explored, the rocky beach. This biome has two main features that I'm keen to exploit bull kelp stalks and anemones. Bull kelp stalks in the ocean require significant effort if you want to plant them just anywhere, but here on the beach there are stalks aplenty ready to be picked up and placed wherever you like on the lunar shores. Bull kelp grows throughout all of the seasons, and notably each serving of kelp fronds saps 10 sanity, plummeting our enlightenment and quieting all the gestalts nearby. Anemones are these funky little six-pointed starfish that will pop up and bite anything that stands on them, dealing a decent chunk of damage. In their closed state, you can pick them up with a shovel and place them elsewhere, and after a while they'll flop open again, making them ideal for killing another mob found across the island that we'll see later. For now I return to the base and tend to my farm awaiting for day 5. As soon as the light dawns, I head to the nearest shore and plant all of the bull kelp stalks, which raises our enlightenment by a good margin for treating plants so well. With all of them down, I head back to the beach to collect more anemones. Just like day 4 I decide to do a little gardening before settling in for the night, before I hear the growling of one of the Lunar Island's few persistent threats. The hounds come at the beginning of day 6. Well, hounds singular. I bait them over to the salamanders at the nearby hot spring who, despite their small size, are quite powerful, hence my caution while gathering charcoal. The monster meat the hounds drop here is quite nice, as it drains 15 sanity uncooked, but is poisonous to most characters as Wormwood were fine, making it another option to keep the Moon Ghosts at bay. Returning to the Loon Trees that I burned down on day 4, 
I chopped them down to claim 36 bits of charcoal that will be instrumental in making one of the best structures in Don't Starve, before I am spotted and harried by some shattered spiders. After retreating to the base, we find some of our first fully grown crops. A few potatoes, a pumpkin, and some corn. All crops that grow well in the autumn. Day 7 I set out to collect rocks and twigs, gathering 18 cut stone and 36 twigs before finally on day 8 I bring all of it together to build 6 crockpots. The crockpot is perhaps one of the biggest leaps in knowledge a new player in Don't Starve can make, going from subsisting on raw morsels and carrots to fully taking advantage of the ingredients before them. Most of the downside of raw food, however, comes in the form of sanity loss, which as we've established is actually a boon out here. So things like raw meat and kelp tend to be better for us when eaten raw. After gathering another harvest of bull kelp and tending to the plants, I prepare to add another ingredient to our repertoire. As day 9 dawns, I start the day by locating the nearest shattered spider hole, placing two strips of anemones just outside the webbing. The idea here is that I'll run in between the two lines of traps, causing any spiders chasing me from the hole to die to starfish bites, expending little to no resources acquiring spider glands, monster meat, and silt. After using most of our bull kelp to keep the gestalts off our back, we test out the trap and manage to kill three shattered spiders without taking any damage. Kiting them through the traps here is a bit finicky, and they have a tendency to get stuck on the shattered spider hole, which causes some issues getting them all slain but for the most part this will be a valuable part of our diet going forward. Speaking of, a few more potatoes and eggplants cropped up while we were away, and the potatoes even yielded a few seeds each, allowing us to expand the farm without the risk of unknowingly sowing weeds in amongst the actual crops. Day 10 started with a small cooking session, turning some monster meat and vegetables into meatballs. Almost every crockpot dish, however, restores a small amount of sanity, so it may or may not be worth it to create some of them out here. Returning to our shattered spider hole, both of the spiders sent out to scout my presence managed to Three Stooges style trap themselves on this bit of coast, requiring me to bait them around the den to actually kill. Though I got unlucky in dodging their glass spike attack and took some damage, I managed to snag a few pieces of silk before leaving to my crops. I do have to be very careful about taking damage in this challenge, as if I ever reach zero health, I die, and out here on the Lunar Island I have no access to any of the means of resurrection commonly available. A watermelon and a pumpkin have grown, despite watermelon being a spring and summer crop. This will be useful later on, as the fashion melon is one of the only pieces of cooling headgear that we'll be able to build when summer heat sets in. As dusk falls, the island is almost entirely lit up, as the full moon of day 11 is approaching. So I head off to the quarry biome to mine the three inviting formations that contain the three pieces of the celestial altar. While I'm mining, I try to keep my pickaxes at 3%, one use away from breaking, as we can recycle them later and save a little bit of flint in the process. Day 11 is the aforementioned first full moon, and as such, every celestial fissure is absolutely pouring with enlightenment, making it difficult to stay in the Gestalts' good graces. This makes it tricky to move the already cumbersome celestial altar pieces, as Gestalts will slow us down with drowsiness and also slap the altar piece out of our hands. I use the base of the altar to plug up the fissure smack dab in the center of our base, so it stops flooding my mind with enlightenment. Having the altar placed in a fissure also makes it emit a small amount of light, even on new moons when the fissures are snuffed out. As the full moon shines down on the bubbling hot springs, they also turn into moonglass, which I mine for useful moonglass shards as well as the pretty to look at but useless blue gems. Pretty much everything we can do with blue gems is inaccessible to us, as without rabbits to make the Presta Hattitator or a wicker bottom player to make the Everything Encyclopedia book, we have no way to learn magic, and all uses for gems require rope, nightmare fuel, or boat. On day 12 I finally moved the last piece of the Celestial Altar into place, granting us access to the new Celestial tab. This lets us make our own bath bombs, glass axes, and most notably one of the only proper weapons we can make with our limited resources glass cutters. With 68 damage, these are meant to be a lunar alternative to the Dark Sword, and while they're less durable unless you're fighting shadow monsters, beggars can't be choosers out here on the Lunar Island, so these will be our main source of damage. The glass cutter actually has this snazzy Terraria crossover skin with the Terra Prisma, and Clay has provided me with a few codes to give away as part of Don't Star's 10 year anniversary so I've set up a giveaway in the description where you can get entries by visiting me on YouTube and following my Twitch channel over at twitch.tv slash sirtoastyt. In the giveaway I have a terrorized chest which contains six of these Don't Starve X Terraria crossover skins, 
a magmatic bundle that contains the magmatic skin set for a bunch of characters as well as skins from the Forge game mode, and 10,000 spools that you can use to craft DLC characters or woven rarity item skins. So be sure to check out the link in the description and enter your name into the giveaway, and in one week I'll select three winners and email them their codes to be redeemed in-game. The glass cutter proves to be very useful immediately, as during the dusk we're beset again by hounds and witness another of the gruesome transformations the Moon Island has caused, horror hounds. Every basic hound that dies on this island has a 50% chance of turning inside out and coming back from the dead in a gruesome display of meat and teeth. Luckily, our glass cutter does enough damage to strike them down a second time before they can retaliate. At night, the gestalt slow me down just enough for a shattered spider to get a hit in, but I make off with another piece of silk for my trouble. Day 13 consists of another harvest of twigs, kelp, and crops, allowing me to eat another raw kelp slurry till the voices of enlightenment in my head stop making so much noise. A rare dragon fruit finishes growing today, and I turn it into a dragon pie, a dish that restores plenty of hunger and health, but is hampered by the rarity of its key ingredient. Also, because Wormwood can't heal from food, I'm not worried about trying to save it for when we can grow more in the spring and summer. Another scrape from the Shattered Spiders gets me thinking about healing. While food is a very common source of health in this game, Wormwood has another option, fertilizer. On day 14, I take my gathered stone fruits from the bushes around the island and split them open with a pickaxe. These yield rocks and ripe stone fruit, which are about the same stats as carrots, but rot extremely quickly. This is ideal for us, however, as each piece of rot restores 2-3 to three health for Wormwood, so once these turn into a moldy mush we can slather ourselves and heal up. With all the crops growing in, we have no shortage of food, and our meatballs start to go stale. After finally realizing I have all the silk needed for a bird trap, we make our way to the rocky beaches where reed plants grow, gathering enough to make two sheets of papyrus and by extension a bird cage. With an imprisoned crow, we can now make eggs out of meat and recycle any spoiling farm crops by turning them back into seeds. We can also feed excess seeds to the bird to make guano, which, like rot, can be rubbed on Wormwood's planty body to heal a small amount. Kicking off day 15 with our avian friend's eternal imprisonment, we follow up by returning to the spiders to watch themselves get stuck before a gestalt slows me down, allowing one of the spiders to poke me twice with their spikes. We get a few spider glands out of the deal, which we could use to heal Wormwood or be upgraded into healing salve with some rocks and ash, healing a good 20 HP if anything burns up. After doing a little more planting, I decided to silence the gestalts by enjoying some raw monster meat before gathering some of the loon tree blossoms in order to make another bath bomb. On day 16, I plopped the bath bomb into a nearby hot spring in order to ripen one of the salamanders and exploit their short-range flamethrower again in order to burn some twigs into ash. With this convoluted method of what could be accomplished with a simple torch if we had any grass, I'm able to make a couple healing salves to regenerate my health before heading back to the cause and solution of all my health problems, the spiders. Luckily, I managed to avoid any damage and return to base to find my stone fruits have all turned to rot, allowing me to heal back up to full. Seeing a group of mudfish while harvesting kelp gave me an idea to make a sea fishing rod and potentially add another type of food to our menu. But for now, without the proper amount of silk in reserve, I'll have to wait until we kill some more spiders. Day 17 is where things started to fall into a bit of a routine. Talk to crops, bait spiders, harvest twigs and kelp as applicable, plant any seeds that birds drop, repeat. Luckily for us, hounds showed up to make things a little less dull right around dusk. But with the glass cutter handy, we can bait out one bite from a hound and swing three times before they can get another attack in. So long as they attack one at a time, hounds and horror hounds are easy pickings with our lunar weaponry. Ending the day with a stockpile of food so large our meatballs are almost rotted away. I started day 18 by heading out to the loon tree forest again. With only three days until our first winter, I needed a few more bath bombs to toss into the nearby hot spring. With a boiling spring giving off plenty of heat and light until day 31's next full moon, they'll keep us nice and toasty throughout most of the winter. After doing some item juggling and eating our spoiling meatballs as a way to reduce sanity, I headed back to the altar and popped another bath bomb into the nearby springs. I was initially hesitant to use the springs closest to our base, as if a ripe salamander ran afoul of any other mob they would likely reduce our base to cinders with their fire attack. Day 19 went by without much incident. Because of the boiling springs ripening the nearby salamanders, I used their flames to torch another pile of twigs and stone fruit as my HP had taken some hits. With another salve and some raw, I healed up most of my HP, and finally crafted a chest to store the ashes, as they're one of the only things I can't just dump on the ground lest they blow away in the wind. 
After catching another crow in the bird trap, I cooked it over the fire alive to guarantee a cooked morsel instead of a jet feather. And by feeding our bird two monster meat, I was able to make a new dish in bacon and eggs. With the depths of the night, wormwood began to indicate that the temperature was dropping, and soon winter would be upon us. Day 20 is our last day of autumn, but with the hot springs nearby, I wasn't very worried. The amount of food in my inventory was starting to be a nuisance, and we would never be able to make an ice box as gears are never available out here on the lunar island. So I just made a regular chest and put all my raw food in there. While it won't slow their spoilage, neither will my inventory, and without grass, inventory space is precious. I crafted another bath bomb and tossed it into the closest hot spring. I figure there's nothing out here that would aggravate the nearby salamanders, so it's unlikely we'll get any surprise arson from them. I also took the near broken pickaxes I had saved and used them to craft the thermal stone. Thermal stones, I feel, are one of the biggest things a new player can learn to craft in this game, besides the crock pot as they make the extreme temperatures of winter and summer much more survivable. With winter looming, I dropped off the thermal stones by the hot spring to heat up, ready for the bitter cold. Honestly, winter on the lunar island is much the same as autumn. Despite the extra blue mixed into the color palette, there are only a few new threats. The cold, which we can combat using heated thermal stones from the hot spring, and the arrival of moonrock pangles, which unlike their conventional cousins, are hostile to anything that moves but are easily avoided if you give their nests a wide berth. Winter also slows the spoilage of food, which is nice because we have no way of doing that ourselves. A flock of moonrock pangles popped out of the water while I was harvesting kelp, but made a big mistake in trying to fight one of the ripened salad manders, who torched most of them providing me with some free ash and monster meat. Luckily, none of the flaming mutant penguins set anything of value on fire. On day 22, I cooked a few more meatballs before trying to kill some spiders for more meat. Unfortunately, one side effect of carrying a warm thermal stone is that salamanders are attracted to the heat if they're not already preoccupied with an even better heat source like a bubbling hot spring. While trying to keep the salamander off the traps and baiting spiders have mixed results, ultimately nothing too noteworthy came of it. Returning to my crops, I noticed carrots were yielding two seeds from one crop, meaning that they were decently satisfied with the growing conditions. We do have a bit of a scalability problem with the farm currently as without any musical instruments like a pan flute or a one-man band, we'll spend more and more time tending the fields the more we plant. Since seeds keep for a relatively long time without spoiling, we can hang on to them for when we're ready to plant more. Day 23 gave us another hound attack, which went about the same way except I got bitten by one hound. With the guaranteed two hound's teeth that each horror hound was dropping, I then got the idea about getting some insulative clothing. While we can't get beefalo wool without Wilson's beard hair transmutation, and no suspicious dirt piles spawn to hunt down any qualifants, there is one slightly insulative garment that we can make in the form of a dapper hound's tooth vest, which requires more silk than we currently have available. Day 24 was another one that followed our established routine. Another dragon fruit cropped up, which I stored for the spring rather than cook immediately. Now that we had a bird, we could control which type of seeds we plant, and we were getting more good returns from crop plants as long as we planted in the crop's preferred seasons and had at least four grouped up. I decided to farm potato, asparagus, pumpkin, and carrot, as they're right at home in the winter chill. Now that we've passed a quarter of this challenge and shown off the main routine of crops, spiders, and kelp, I'll start skipping days unless something particularly notable happens. Since day 31 was another full moon, our hot springs were going to freeze over soon so I spent day 27 harvesting loon trees to prepare another volley of bath bombs. On day 28, a pomegranate branch that had been growing for a while finally sprouted. Pomegranate and watermelon are some of our only sources of fruit for the crock pot, so I stored it to farm pomegranates in the spring when they're more amenable to growing. By this point I had many many different types of food, and only one chest to store them, so I built a couple more with the new 10 year anniversary chest skin that they gave out as a login bonus. Day 30 saw a decently large hound attack, which I repelled with the help of some salamanders. They dropped plenty of hound's teeth for us to use in making our vest. Speaking of sewing things, I want to avoid staying far away from the hot springs for too long, as if a thermal stone cools down to neutral, it loses a little bit of its durability. They can be repaired with a sewing kit, but at the cost of eight silk per five uses, sewing kits are a little too expensive when I can just avoid lowering the stones' durability at all. Day 31 is notable in Don't Starve Together as it's the first day when the seasonal bosses Deerclops and Berger are able to attack. 
On default settings, Day 31 is winter, so Deerclops acts as one of the biggest hurdles to new players in Don't Starve Together. Deerclops is bigger, meaner, and stronger than anything a player has likely seen before this point. However, they have no interest in players on the Lunar Island, so we're safe from their seasonal rampages. Not like I couldn't take a Deerclops 1v1, you can't prove I couldn't. The full moon did give us more moon glass out of our hot springs. Hot springs that have been mined refill at the start of a new day. So to maintain our heat sources, we need to make sure to empty them before the night ends. After the pools were refilled on day 32, I crafted a couple new glass cutters in case I ended up needing more firepower, and dropped a couple of bat bombs to keep up our heat and light. A new flock of moonrock pengals spawned as I fought the shattered spiders, and they were amusing to watch as they waddled right through my enemies, skewering themselves in the process. While we can get ice from moonrock pangles and the minkin glaciers that they spawn by their nest, any ice that we have will definitely be melted by the summer. So without an ice box to keep them safe, I'm basically relegated to using them as crockpot filler. Speaking of spoilage, with almost an entire stack of carrots going stale, I decided to turn them into seeds via the bird, which should allow us to plant as many carrots as we want for some time. With a steady diet of raw kelp and monster meat, we had no issues keeping our enlightenment down when planting so many crops. Day 35 is the last day of winter. Despite this, the temperatures will stay low especially during early spring dusts and nights, so our need for thermal stones won't be alleviated for some time. In an attempt to justify the silken boards I spent on it, I used my sea fishing rod to catch a lunar wobster. These guys are one of the easiest things to catch, offering no resistance to being reeled in. But since they can't be cooked and just provide another source of moon glass, I just dropped it on the ground so it could slowly crawl back into the ocean. With day 36, we got an announcement that Wormwood was feeling bloomy. This is a sort of form change Wormwood undergoes during springtime, or whenever they lather up with fertilizer containing growth formula. When fully bloomed, Wormwood gains a slight resistance to overheating, and a speed boost making getting around the island much quicker, and also automatically tends to any nearby farm plants. With this in mind, I planted all of the carrot and toma root seeds that we had stockpiled, as tending a large field like this will be a breeze. The only downside is that Wormwood has a 1.2 times increased hunger drain from his bloom state, but with all the extra food now growing, we'll have no issues on that front. The biggest danger in spring is the pouring rain, which causes our temperature and sanity to plummet, and rots any food caught out in the rain even faster, so I decided to keep all the food in these waterproof chests. I also started a small secondary farm away from the main one to avoid plants being stressed from any weeds that pop up from the unidentified seeds. As a plant, Wormwood doesn't mind the torrential downpour, but they can still lose their grip on slippery tools and still get chilled by being soaked. On day 38, Wormwood finished blooming, gaining the appearance and delicious dragonfruit flavor of a ripe salamander. To complement my new appearance, I made an item I have never crafted on any other Don't Starve world, the Siri. This item is... one of the most useless in the game. It's meant to be a sort of anti-garland to soothe your nerves while you're on the lunar island, and given that the garland barely gives you any sanity, the sea wreath barely lowers your enlightenment, especially with all the active celestial fissures. To complete the outfit, I put on a dapper vest, instantly nullifying any sanity drain the sea wreath may have had. While it would keep me warm, I quickly discarded the vest for later, as it was antithetical to keeping my enlightenment down. Day 40 marked the arrival of our first boss, and a swift reminder of why I shouldn't plant too many crops at once. The Lord of the Fruit Flies. This insectile annoyance shows up after at least 30 days have passed when 15 fully grown crops are visible on screen, and can show up even earlier if crops are left to rot on the vine. While he sports much less health and is easier to kite than most other bosses, his presence was still very annoying to say the least. With our fully bloomed speed boost, I managed to depose this lord without too much damage, and any annoyances he caused to our crops were quickly remedied by passing over them with our bloom. When killed for the first time, Lord of the Fruit Flies will drop a friendly fruit fly fruit, which acts as a follower beacon for the friendly fruit fly, who will automatically tend any nearby crops. Once that business was all sorted, I was then attacked by a very timely hound wave, who had now added blue hounds to their ranks. I was a bit nervous because night was soon approaching and day 41's new moon dampened the celestial fissures' light. Luckily, there are only a few hounds this wave, and I managed to return to base before darkness fell. With Wormwood's ability to tent huge groups of crops at once, I was able to make a staggering supply of fruits and vegetables. Most crops grow well in the spring, and I was soon unable to eat all of the food I was producing before it started to rot in storage, so I turned it into a mountain of seeds for later. 
Anything that rotted completely wasn't totally wasted as well, because it just meant more healing for later. Watermelons, as mentioned, will be a particularly useful fruit, as the fashion melon is a big part of my strategy to get through the summer heat. Combined with pomegranates, I can also use it to make fruit medley, a crockpot dish that cools you down. On day 45, I got a bit careless and stepped on one of my anemones, which dealt a hefty chunk of damage. Since I had been slacking on keeping a stock of healing salves, I again used a ripe salamander to burn some twigs and heal myself back up. To prepare for the summer, I made a new chest to store anything flammable on the ground, so there would be fewer things on the ground that could ignite from the heat. I also moved my saplings away from the rest of the structures to prevent the chance of a fire spreading through the entire base. With one last massive harvest of dragon fruit, pomegranate, and watermelon, we head into our fourth season. While spring had its challenges, I was a little nervous going into the summer, as it would provide us with some of our biggest challenges yet. As day 56 opened up, I immediately set to combating the scorching temperatures we'd be facing for the next 15 days. Despite being the inverse of winter, we had considerably fewer tools to beat the heat. Our main source of cooling would be the endothermic fire pit we had fretted getting the gold for all those days ago, and I wanted to keep it blasting all throughout the season. To keep us cool on the go, we turn once again to our trusty thermal stones, which will be kept ice cold by the endothermic fire. With our stockpile of watermelon, I also constructed a fashion melon, which will keep our temperature down and provide a little bit of wetness to keep us cool as well. But just keeping ourselves cool is only the beginning of summer's challenges. The heat can also cause flammable objects to spontaneously combust, and during the summer, fire spreads further and faster than any other season. So preventing fires before they start is paramount, as we have no access to things like ice staves and watering cans to stop them otherwise. Finally, the needy antlion will emerge from the summer and demand tributes of rocks and eggs in the desert. Since we can't leave the island to satiate her, we'll need to dodge the sinkholes caused by her tantrums in order to keep ourselves and our base in one piece. On day 58, I discovered that a bunch of the seeds we had stockpiled were about to rot. With our blooming form about to revert without the springtime air, I fed all of them to our bird friend to make guano as a useful fuel for our cold fire. Spoilage is accelerated by the summer heat, so everything from the food in our stockpiles to the fashion melon on our head will go south very, very quickly. Between the renewable sources of kelp and monster meat, we had no shortage of food, but keeping any in reserve was going to be a challenge. Funnily enough, the Reap What You Sow update that made this large field of crops possible is also the update that cut off any chance of obtaining grass out here on the Lunar Island. Before that update in early 2021, the farm crops Wormwood and other farms could produce were susceptible to withering under the summer sun, and when picked would yield none other than a single piece of cut grass. Perhaps if I took on this challenge over two years ago, we would have been able to make even a singular rope. Day 60 marked our first run-in with an antlion tantrum. If the sinkholes spawn under anything that can be chopped, mined, hammered, or dug, they'll destroy it, making this the only way for us to hammer anything such as the sea bones on the rocky beach and obtain bone shards. Unlike in the winter though, I was wary of leaving my base for an extended period except to flee from the odd hound wave or antlion tantrum, as if we leave the base and something catches fire, it could spell disaster. Speaking of wildfires, Day 61 saw our sapling field go up in flames. While I was distracted making a new fashion melon and tending the endothermic fire pit, one of them began to smolder and caught fire before I could put it out. Moving the saplings proved to be the right move as nothing else burned down, but this did cold the sapling population of the Lunar Island by about 80%. With almost all of our food stale or spoiling, things weren't looking super. As a silver lining, spoiled food reduces sanity, and Wormwood is immune to the health-dropping effect, making a stack of mushy pomegranates or half-rotten dragon fruits into a source of enlightenment-dropping food that we could keep the gestalts quiet with. On day 64, we got another seismic attack from Antlion, so I used the excuse to gather kelp while I was out of the base. With another large portion of the seeds we accrued about to spoil, I fed the bird a few hundred seeds to turn into guano at an alarming rate. The following day, the hounds attacked once more, with too many of them at once to face in single combat with my glass cutter. I brought them to where a majority of the salamanders were living in order to have them fight the pint-sized powerhouses, and walked away without so much as a scratch. On day 66, my last fashion melon spoiled without any watermelon in storage to replace it, and with the watermelon plant still growing in the farm, I spent the next few days hugging the endothermic fire pit a little closer than usual. 
Besides the same crockpot smoldering three times in the same day and another attempt on our lives by antlion, we were able to get by with no issues. By day 68, the watermelons had grown in, and I was back to maintaining my wildfire vigil with a funky hat once more. Luckily for us, the temperature dropped significantly in the last few days of summer, meaning it's cooled off enough that things won't spontaneously combust. Since I didn't have to watch my base as closely with the threat of wildfires gone, I spent day 70 gathering the other saplings growing on the island that were spared the inferno that befell the others. In one last desperate attempt on our ankles, Antlion launched another assault that did basically nothing, except put some ugly craters in the beach and break a single sea bones that happened to be nearby. Day 71 and we're back to the safety of autumn. I decided to plant multiple crops in groups of 14, spacing them out both physically and in terms of time of planting so that Lord of the Fruit Flies won't be lured in by our crops again. Since we already had a friendly fruit fly in our world, killing the lord a second time would only yield a leafy meat and a handful of crop seeds relevant to the season. Hardly worth it at this stage. After a relatively uneventful autumn and with less than 20 days left on the clock, I finally realized that there was one more thing I could achieve on this island. Finally getting some more inventory space for my character. Without grass or pigskin available, there's no way to craft a backpack or a piggyback, or even the insulated pack which required gears and berger fur. But there's one option for inventory space that still remains. The Krampus Sack. Krampus is a mob that spawns if the player kills too many innocent creatures, and tall birds, in quick succession, stealing as many items as it can before jumping into the sack and leaving. The Krampus Sack is both the best inventory upgrade in the game at 14 additional slots, and a 1% drop from each individual Krampus. This thing is often the object of much grinding in long-term Don't Starve worlds, especially grindy here as we have only one Lunar Island native that gives any naughtiness points. Crows. Bird traps would be much too slow to catch and murder each individual bird, so to kill enough to draw Krampus's ire we must turn to our only ranged option, boomerangs. With one charcoal, one board, and one silk, we can kill up to ten birds with one... boomerang. I spent day 82 using our tried and true salamander bait strategy to turn as much forest as I could into charcoal, as we'd need as much as we could muster. With over a stack of charcoal to my name, I sat a ways away from my base just so that any Krampus that managed to escape wouldn't have sconed with any items that I cared about, and began killing any crow that set foot on my island. Each crow is worth one point of naughtiness, and Krampus will only spawn after a randomly chosen 31 to 50 naughtiness point threshold is reached. This also provided us with as much food as we could possibly want, as the raw morsels were plentiful and perfect for keeping enlightenment down. Midday 84, our first wave of three Krampi appeared. They increase in numbers as the world progresses through the days, letting us get multiple attempts from one spawn. While one of them escaped, another managed to skewer themselves on the anemones without me even trying, as the last one fell to my glass cutter. With plenty of morsels and monster meat, I was able to make a steady diet of bacon and eggs that would last us for quite a while. Two days later on day 86, we managed to spawn another wave of Krampi. As another of them escaped and yet another stepped all over my anemones, I began to wonder if I could defeat all three by chasing them over my traps. While I took a few kicks from the one that I hit with a boomerang, we were four Krampi down and still no sack to show for it. At this point, I had kind of neglected my crop farms, as crow slaying and Krampus killing was taking over the last portion of this challenge. Starting day 87 with a breakfast of crow eggs and Krampi bacon, I was immediately back on the grind. At this point, our silk reserves were starting to dwindle, meaning I had to kite spiders over the anemones once again in an attempt to keep the boomerangs flowing. The morning of day 89, a new wave of Krampi stepped in to prevent my crow rampage, undeterred by the fates of the others before them. Putting my anemone theory to the test, I exploited the fact that Krampus will run from you until you hit it, and managed to kill all three on the anemones. While all my attention was focused on killing as many Krampi as possible, the winter crept in with very little fanfare. Having already dealt with the winter once before, I simply popped a bath bomb into the nearby hot springs, grabbed a thermal stone, and continued my crow massacre. Later in day 91, we were beset by our first hound attack containing a varglet, a sort of larger mini-boss hound with the ability to summon even more hounds to its side. A nearby ripe salamander cut into its HP by lighting it and many surrounding hounds of flame, which gave us plenty of opportunity to pick off its minions while it was distracted. I also forgot that Day 91 was a full moon, meaning I needed to remake all the bath bombs I used as they turned to moonglass instead of providing heat. 
Once we were back on track on day 93, I was able to completely sustain myself on the raw morsels and monster meat I was accruing from the crows and shattered spiders, eliminating the need for a crockpot or even a cooking fire, given Wormwood's immunity to the ill effects of monster meat. At dusk, another trio of thieving Krampi appeared, and one of them managed to... break? Apparently, mobs that are trying to interact with an item like spiders eating meat or Krampi stealing items that then get hit by an anemone will just freeze in place, allowing for me to push them into other anemones or cut them down with my glass cutter. With only six more days in the challenge, I had precious little time to get this Krampus sack, and I was starting to run out of boomerangs and silk to make them with. I even went around to the non-trap shattered spider holes in an attempt to eke out any silk I could. Unfortunately, the last two groups of Krampi failed to leave their mythical sack. And with exactly 100 days passed on the Lunar Island, we only ever had 15 inventory slots to our name. Despite the limited resource pool, I had survived and even thrived on this island, without ever collecting a single piece of grass. And Krampus sack or no, I certainly didn't starve. Shout out to Bidobams for this challenge, and maybe I'll look for more ways to spice up the way I play Don't Starve Together in the future. Thanks for accompanying me on this little challenge, and thanks for watching.